it's a pleasure for our center uh, to announce the second keynote speaker, Dr. Belgrishna Rao, who's from the uh, Indian Institute of Technology in Madras. Yes. You have the floor. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Peter Noringa and your team for uh, organizing this workshop and also giving me the opportunity to make this presentation. Uh, my name is Balkrishna C. Rao, faculty member in the Department of Engineering Design at the Indian Institute of Technology, Madras, India. Uh, engineering Design is a new department in our uh, institute, and we are a multidisciplinary institute. We have electrical, mechanical, and biomedical sciences working together to tackle research problems in automotive and biomedical sectors. Today, my talk will be from an uh, engineer's perspective okay, on uh, innovations, frugal innovations. And I think after this nice tea and coffee, I'm going to put you on a heavy dose of frugality, believe me. There are a lot of slides, a lot of applications, but a uh, lot of pictures. So hopefully that will keep you entertained. Uh, well, here is the you know, quintessential jugad, right? that we have heard about at least. It's a low-cost contraption or a low-cost uh, device that is typically made by assembling parts or salvaging parts from numerous end-of-life systems. What I mean by end-of-life system is a discarded system. It's a technical jargon for a discarded system. So this can be like a discarded truck, a discarded uh, a tractor or a vehicle. So it's a motley of junk parts assembled together nicely to get a functionality. And what is this functionality? Well, to do all kinds of routine chores, you know, take people from point A to point B, you know, transport some little stuff. And this is typically used by this section of society who can't afford to buy something like a new truck or a tractor. Okay, it's a big investment for them. You know, not bad for the functionality that they can get from this, you know, from this nice thing which has been assembled from junkyard parts. So this Jugard, right, has actually lent its name to a concept. Now, before I get to that, uh, the defining feature of this is low cost and the scarcity in resources. Okay, resources in terms of actual material resources and also the knowledge that is, you know, that you need to develop these things. So scarcity induced innovation made affordable. Okay, and uh, this Jugad has lent its name to a concept that has spawned a new philosophy wherein you you, you target low cost and try to frugalize on resources to get low cost. So it's the same frugal innovation concept, okay, wherein I'm trying to get a low cost by frugalizing my resources. And there are many companies and other entities out there who are following this concept unbeknownst to them. Okay, maybe some of them don't want to accept it's a frugal innovation in action. So today I'm going to show you several of those applications. And this will be also interspersed with some of my research. So uh, a frugal innovation then, the defining feature is a low cost, okay, which is made by frugalizing resources. And this concept has created numerous you know, low-cost products and low-cost services in sectors ranging from teaching to healthcare to even astronomy. Okay? And uh, my focus is mainly on the design and manufacturing aspects of these innovations okay? to make them low-cost. There are also other, I think, f uh, features through which you can lower the cost of a frugal innovation. But I am basically concentrating on the design and manufacturing aspects because by doing that, I can control the quality of the innovation. At the same time, I can try to lower its cost. Okay? So the same frugal innovation concept, low cost, trying to frugalize resources, and again, put that into this economy occupied by a lot of these low-income people. And some of these products have also found uses in the rich countries or among, you know, in, in the developed markets. So the next couple of slides, I'm going to show you many of these frugal innovations okay, in uh, uh, increasing levels of sophistication of design and engineering. So the goal right now is to improve the quality of these innovations by putting more science and engineering into it. So the Jugad, right, is the first quintessential frugal innovation. And this is mainly a makeshift arrangement, if I can say that. <coughs> the second one is, again, a makeshift arrangement. This is like a Jugad coffee, wherein uh, it's a typical Indian household pressure cooker, which has been retrofitted to make nice cappuccino. Okay, a very nice way of making cappuccino and also a very cheap way of making cappuccino. And this is also mainly a question of retrofitting, right? You just assemble things together nicely and unbeknownst to the user, it just works, works fine. <coughs> the next one, now we are getting into slightly, you know, increased levels of sophistication. Uh, this is a bamboo cycle, okay? 
a bamboo bicycle and uh, the cost has been reduced by using bamboo. I think I skipped one slide, one second. Yeah, there is this in between, I'm sorry about that. Here again, bamboo has been used to make a <coughs> bamboo microscope. It's a cheap product, low cost has been achieved by using bamboo, which belongs to the grass family. It grows like three centimeters a day. Okay, it's quite cheap and there is not much going into it. It's a single objective lens, okay, and a stand to place your cover slip. Very simple structure. So low cost achieved by simple structure and using bamboo. And a little bit of science has gone into it because you need to know where to place the, you know, your lens and other stuff so you get the right focus. And this has been used <coughs> for elementary teaching, you know, in, uh, as elementary teaching aid in some schools in India. And also I'm told that, or uh, what I've read, there has been one instance of serious research being done with it. Okay? This was fabricated by a company called Jadu Gyan in Delhi, India. I'm going in the reverse direction for some reason. Okay. This is slightly increased level of sof uh, sophistication, which is a bamboo bicycle. Again, we are using bamboo to keep the cost low, but some serious design has gone into it. You see bamboo, besides being cheap, it has also been tested and uh, they have found out that uh, it has got better mechanical properties, okay, or maybe mechanical properties comparable to metals that are used in making cycles. And using bamboo also gives uh, better comfort to the rider. So here is an instance of a frugal innovation which has been made cheap, right, to fr by frugalizing on resources by using bamboo, but it has also been found to have a good functionality or maybe better functionality than what you find in normal cycles. IKEA, right? IKEA's idea, and uh, they have managed to, at least in one of their products, they've reduced their cost by designing their packaging in such a way that they can actually put a three-seating, you know, sofa, three-seater sofa. They've, you know, managed to design the packaging in such a way that they've reduced the cost drastically. Okay, in, in the process, they've actually created a frugal product. But this is not catered to the poor. This is more catered to the well-off. Okay, but again, the frugal concept is also being used there. I'm going in the reverse again. This is need to have more coffee. Uh, here is you know laptop batteries, right? Many of these batteries are uh, just uh, dumped, and I'm, uh, I read that about 50 million of these batteries are dumped uh, yearly, I believe. And uh, these batteries can have some functionality. About 70% of them have enough power to, you know, power a LED light for four hours a day for about a year. And this was featured in the MIT Technology Review. <coughs> this is now, we are going in increasing levels of sophistication. Please <coughs> keep that in mind, okay? <coughs> uh, the theme is same, low cost, but low cost achieved by frugalizing resources, okay? Resources like raw materials but in the presence of good knowledge, science and engineering. Okay, we are, we are going in that level now. We started with something like really, you know, a low sector, a, a low tech uh, application, like a Jugard, and now we are slowly going up one by one. Uh, this is called uh, gravity light, and this I believe was uh, designed in the UK. And what it does, it has got a weight that takes three seconds to fall, okay, or three seconds to go up, and on its way down, like which is I think about 25 minutes, it gives out uh, power to light, light up the surrounding area. Okay, a very nice device. Causes, it costs just three pounds. <coughs> this is something that uh, we have developed in our lab. It is called a frugal water filtration system. Uh, this is a human powered system. Uh, and you have a human being who can sit, you know, like a cycling, a cycle. And as you do that, the pumping is provided by a peristaltic pump. And we figured out that, you know, by using a peristaltic pump, it is a easier, a simpler mechanism and also costless. And this pumping mechanism actually pumps water from a raw water container and filters, uh, filters it to a standard set of filters, including RO. And at the end, you have filtered water to drink. And we are planning to deploy this in rural areas. Okay, and this is uh, what you see on the left. I'm going to run this thing. I got a video to show you. What you see on the left is a, the rickety version is, you know, version one, a prototype. 
I had some, we get some talented students at IIT Madras, and this was developed by one of them. He's currently doing his PhD at uh, University of California, Berkeley. And this idea has been taken forward, and about 10 students have worked on it, 10 different students. And what you see on the right is version 2. And currently we are in the process of developing version 3. And version 3 will be commercially deployed in the southern region of India to rural villages where, you know, these people can cycle and, you know, filter water out. Eventually, my plan is to assemble this with a tricycle so that you can transfer people, passengers, you know, you can also filter water at the same time. Okay, you try to combine a couple of things into one product. Again, please notice this, you know, what started from the poorer sections of society, you know, frugality, I believe that it is having like serious ramifications, right, in different sectors without a lot of people knowing about it. Of course, if you read The Economist, they keep on mentioning this. You know, there is Shampita keeps on, you know, tracking like where frugal innovation stands currently. <clears throat> the video that I promised. Okay, so here it is. And you can see my student actually, you know, he's turning it by hand. And you can see the water actually coming here. I hope it is clear. There is the input water tank right there, and the output is right here. And in between, you see the set of filters. That sound is kind of very, you know, if you have a nice lunch and you keep on hearing playing that video, it lulls you to sleep. The sound is, has a soporific effect. <clears throat> One of the advantages of working in frugality. Okay, here is yet another example. This is called uh, Gram Power. Again, developed by a couple of uh, Indian students who were formerly part of the, I think, IIT Delhi. And they went to the US for graduate studies. After coming back, they had this motivation to develop uh, a product which can actually, you know, it's like a micro grid. You can employ that to electrify a certain section of rural region in India. It's currently being deployed in the northern side. Uh, affordable microgrid system and very low recharging rates. And the way they achieved this low cost is to mount, you know, simple solar panels on telephone lines. Couple of them, does, they do the trick. And you have this nice system now to power, you know, rural sites at a very cheap rate. This is, I think, uh, very, uh, one of my favorites, uh, Unilever has been catering to the bottom of the pyramid for a long time with uh, numerous, numerous, you know, like frugal products in terms of, you know, these sachets of shampoos and, you know, everything done in smaller quantities and trying to sell this to the, you know, rural folk or people in the low-income region. And this is one reason why, you know, Unilever has done much better than PNG. PNG seems to work, Procter & Gamble's, they seem to be doing very well in the developed market, but India, at least, you know, some time back they were not a success because Unilever, you know, uh, invested a lot in research in India, trying to see, you know, how you can make something for the low-income segment to the poor and, you know, try to make money out of that. In fact, many of these products are now going back to the developed world where they are also being used because when you have uh, all these crises happening, you know, like the financial crisis and whatnot, you have the ranks of, you know, the unemployed swelling. So you need the same things on the other side of the, you know, uh, globe too, to cater to the masses, you know, of the people who are, who, who crave for such things. <clears throat> this is great. Uh, the frugal concept was taken up, I think, by uh, G very seriously, G Healthcare. And uh, G actually had this uh, ultrasound market in China, wherein they were trying to sell this bulky, clunky, you know, things that they made for the developed markets. And it was not a success. First of all, it was very expensive and not very suitable for uh, Chinese rural regions. So they decided, you know, is it possible to make something, you know, at a very a low cost version, you know, redesigning this thing, redesigning this whole concept. And what they came up with was like, you know, using a, a probe and a laptop, but with a very sophisticated software to do the same thing. And believe me, it's been a success. What was $100,000 came down to about $15,000, 2007 price. And not only that, right, this is now being used in the U.S. in emergency rooms to identify, you know, pregnancies at accident sites to check for fluid around heart and many other applications. 
So there are also applications to develop markets. Um, and if you see the new global market, GE now has this ultrasound from 15K to 100K. And 2008, you can see that you know, their uh, 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 revenues from this product alone has gone up by many, many, many times. <clears throat> this is uh, GE's Mac 400. Uh, this is again a portable, again the same frugal concept, but it's a portable ECG. You know, ECGs, electrocardiograms, right? Again, kind of clunky instruments. And uh, normal ECG is also quite expensive. So G now has this uh, G's Mac 400 for $800, as opposed to, I believe, the conventional one is about fifteen dollars to $25,000, if I'm not mistaken. So $400, and this can be employed in many of the rural areas, and even in many other areas where people are well off, but these have newer applications there. The other in services side, right? This is Narayana Ridayalaya from India. India is kind of India has been like in the uh, front of uh, forefront of medical tourism for quite some time now. There are many of these hospitals that cater to a lot of you know the tourists and people who come for uh, you know very complex uh, heart treatments and other kinds of ailments. And what this particular hospital chain has done is take uh, Henry Ford's you know uh, production. Uh, concept, mass, you know, this mass production concept, and they've used that for bypass surgeries and other kinds of surgeries, wherein you have, you know, many hospital beds, and there are these highly trained doctors, and they do the same repetitive, you know, uh, tasks again and again. And in the process, they have cut the cost down, and they also give you quality care, also give you quality care. In fact, Vokhards, the other chain in India, has pioneered innovative uh, uh, bypass surgeries, wherein they don't give uh, anesthesia to the student. Uh, to the uh, patient. So while he's wide awake, he's being operated on his heart. Okay, it's a very innovative concept, again, low cost, but also at the same time giving good quality health care. And of course, then you have a nano, right? And uh, Tata's started this concept, right? It was called the poor, hailed as the poor man's car in India. A very nice concept, actually. Uh, the first couple of nanos had problems, definitely. I mean, you might have read about the engines catching fire and whatnot. Might have been some engineering glitches, but those issues are getting ironed out. Okay, but it's a nice concept. And a lot of, I think, uh, other car companies have latched onto it, including, you know, Toyota and Nissan. This is something great. Uh, for TB, right, when you diagnose TB, you take the sputum, of, your, of the patient concern, and this is actually sent to a hospital where they do a lot of uh, you know, analysis to figure out whether the patient has TB. So what these researchers have figured out at Stanford is to, uh, if I take the sputum and you mix it with a special you know, fluorescent molecule, and you shine, you shine a diode light on that, the light coming out, right, the filtered light coming out of that, this diode also has a filter attached to it in a box. So the filtered light can be captured by a smartphone camera and sent to a hospital, okay, which based on the fluorescent signal coming out will tell you whether the patient has TB. It's a very low cost version to tackle TB, you know, diagnose TB in rural areas. In fact, your smartphones have been used for, you know, some of these low, you know, frugal applications in healthcare. The other thing is in Africa, I think this intestinal worm, uh, worms problems, and what this one researcher has done is to attach an inexpensive uh, lens to a smartphone and he actually, you know, looks at the stool samples and he can actually focus, click and tell, you know, whether this person has that problem and what kind of, you know, uh, remedies have to be given. <coughs> Smartphone technology, fluorescent dyeing for frugal diagnosis of TB. Uh, again, this is for, uh, what you see there is a strip of paper and on that you find uh, functional biological circuits, okay? And these circuits are like biological circuits which have been freeze-dried. So when you rehydrate them or maybe put some kind of, you know, water or kind of hydrate them back again, these circuits are active. And once they are active, they can actually be used to distinguish strains of viruses of Ebola. Okay, so this has been one instance where a frugal technology has been used specifically for Ebola. <coughs> This is uh, African mobility. I think uh, 
Africa is one of the countries that pioneered the use of uh, mobile phones, you know, or mobile phony for banking and lot of other uh, economic transactions. In fact, you know, there, there are case studies written on their fisheries and uh, other business uh, sectors wherein mobile phony has been used to advantage, okay, which has been uh, just transformed their business landscape like anything. In fact, the company M-Pesa in Africa for mobile banking has got lessons for many other uh, banking giants around the world. <coughs> pollution. Pollution is a big problem these days, right? You take Beijing or Delhi, other places. So, sensors for the people. In fact, now you have this uh, do-it-yourself movement going around, right? Wherein people want to assemble the kits on their own. You have a simple set of instructions, you build these things, and maybe I can do it on my own. The advantage of doing this is, if there are all these people who, you know, get this data and put it on the web, you know, you can use big data techniques to analyze what's happening in a region, what's the amount of pollution and what not. So, this concept is being seriously looked at now for uh, looking at uh, particulate matter, which is, you know, uh, 2.5 micro, uh, microns or even 10 microns, which are really bad. And there are these dust, you know, air quality against smart citizen kit. African ingenuity, this is really amazing. Uh, I think uh, what some parts of Africa, I think especially uh, what has been shown there, what these people have done, or what they have at least uh, used from one of the US companies, they cannot, they cannot use Doppler radar systems to track you know, the coming of thunderstorms. So this company has actually given them this software wherein they can triangulate lightning, and using lightning, they can figure out what's going to be the amount of rainfall. In fact, this thing is so good that it is now being currently deployed again in the US. Okay, it's a low-cost technology, but apparently it's much more accurate than the Doppler radar. So this technology costs about $1 million, as opposed to a Doppler radar, which costs about $10 million. Again, all coming from the simple frugal concept. Okay, you're frugalizing on your resources. Astronomy can be cheap. The, I don't know if you've heard about the square kilometer array in Africa. The square kilometer array, right? Africa is also into this race, on, uh, race for astronomy. And what they have done, again, because uh, of, uh, you know, uh, shoestring budgets, right? lesser amounts of money, the idea here is to use communication satellites, right? Discarded communication satellites, retrofit them so they can be used as, you know, radio telescopes, an array of them, okay? So this is now part of the square kilometer array in uh, Africa. Africa has done a lot in this. Uh, it's, it's India, China, and Africa, okay? You see a lot of these examples of frugal innovations or that frugal theme underlying many of these innovations in these countries. India space scientists, this is, uh, you know, what you see there on the cycle is actually the nose cone of a rocket. India's space program was always uh, uh, kind of low on the budget, okay, cash, uh, cash trapped, you can say that. And uh, here, these are scientists taking it to the launch center in Tumba, you know, Equatorial Launch Center in India. And uh, since then, I think we have come a long way. And recently, we have had uh, a success with the Mangalyan, right, supposed to be a low cost like Mars uh, program. The amazing thing about Mangalyan, it costed about 74 million, which is lesser than setting up a cricket team in the Indian Premier League. <laughs> this is actually it's quite serious. There is a lot of serious, what, what, you, what you need to appreciate here to keep the cost down, right? To make this, if I can call it frugal, a lot of serious science and engineering has gone into it. Okay? We need to couple more research with frugality. That's what I'm trying to get out here the message at least. Uh, again, uh, Britain had this uh, Beagle 2 to Mars, which I think 2003 program, which actually crashed. But the recent, uh, you know, verdict on that is it was not that bad after all. It was made on a very uh, shoestring budget, but apparently it worked quite well, quite well. They have uh, recently spotted the wreckage on Mars, thanks to one of the rovers. <laughs> Debris finally found. This is great. Uh, African astronomy, it's a 11 meter telescope called SALT. Again, budget constraints, budgetary constraints, and this is what uh, Africa's answer to that. It's amazing what they've done. This has got numerous features which makes it low cost. And typically telescopes, you know, they uh, try to pan the sky with a couple of movements. You have, you know, translational and rotary movements. So what these scientists have done here, they have fixed one of the movements so you have to develop the mechanisms only for the other two or maybe the other one. 
So that reduces your cost. And the other thing is when you have a mirror for a telescope, like what you see here, you typically use uh, something called a paraboloid mirror. Parabola is a curve that is supposed to you know, collect the optimum amount of light for telescopy, uh, as opposed to something spherical. But if you collect light on a spherical mirror, there, are something called, there is something called an aberration, an anomaly. So what they have done, they have used a spherical mirror and used an aberration character to get the final image out. And they haven't made the whole mirror in one piece. They have made them in individual pieces, as you can see here, hexagonal pieces, and finally joined them together okay, to keep the cost low. And they had a lot of problems you know, in trying to get this work, but finally it did work. And this was taken from Nature magazine. And Nature claims that you know, if uh, the VLT and the Keck, the Keck and VLT are like you know, conventional telescopes, I think uh, built mainly by the Euro Euro European Space Agency. And if those are like a Ferrari, then the salt is like a family car. <laughs> okay, so really, it's like 30 million as opposed to spending something like 100 and above on VLT and the Keck. Uh, I think I've talked about this. Uh, price average. This is uh, what what this thing does is to complement the uses of other telescopes around the world. So they wanted to concentrate on spectroscopy as opposed to the images. Okay, so that that way they can be useful to you know uh, astronomers around the world. And initially, when they started this, there was lo there were a lot of problems, and it's amazing how this thing was sorted out. If anybody has the interest, you know, you can write me later. I can send you this article. It's amazing. You should go through it. It's a nice African uh, uh, exercise in ingenuity on how they made this thing work. <clears throat> Again, cheap telescopes, right? Aid exoplanet detection. Does any one of you know what's an exoplanet? you know what I'm talking about? You know the solar system, right? An exoplanet is a planet quite away from here, right? And there is always that, uh, uh, how do I call it? You know, people are interested in knowing if there are aliens out there. And currently, uh, we are trying to figure out if there is life elsewhere and can we communicate and whatnot, okay? So uh, it's a sort of uh, science fiction stories. But now people are actually putting serious money into it because there, is, there are some serious lessons in that. So. The way you do this is to have a telescope out there in space, okay, uh, so that you can focus or you know you can peer deeper into the universe and figure out if you have any planets like Earth outside our solar system. But what these scientists have done, they have a ground-based telescope, right, in Spain, where they where they managed to locate an other Earth-like planet, which is twice the size of Earth. It's called Cancri 55. Again, done from a ground-based telescope that is really very cheap in astronomical terms. <laughs> and now there is a uh, craze for these you know, cheap satellites, small satellites. I don't know if you are aware of this. There are, uh, if, you, if you work in many of these technical universities, uh, we have the small satellite programs wherein we encourage our students to give payloads for small satellites. It's become that cheap now. You know, any average you know, uh, Joe can actually send an experiment out there. And this is what you have here. You have these three different, uh, four different programs, Dove, SkySat, Landsat 8, and Worldview 3. Landsat 8 and Worldview 3 are conventional ones, the big ones. The other ones, you can see that the scale is about one meter and how small they are. By being small, they're also very cheap. Okay? The advantages of this are if you have swarms or many of these small satellites let in orbit, right? they can do some serious satellite work. It's like, you know, imagine opening Google and I want to, you know, see this part of the planet real time, I can do that. We're trying to go to that kind of, uh, you know, uh, modernity. And this has led to something called CubeSats, which are much smaller than what we saw there. So each of these satellites, what you see, the small thing coming out there, right? It's like about 10 centimeter by 10 centimeter by 30. Again, that is quite small in astronomical terms. This is amazing. This is, uh, if you have uh, kept track of the news, right? SpaceX is the private sector or the private company which is trying to launch rockets, right, uh, into space. Uh, and they recently tried to cut costs, you know, or, uh, you know, to reuse the first stage of the rockets. And the deal here was, as you can see in that diagram on the left, right, as the rocket goes here and as it sheds the first stage, the stage is supposed to, you know, 
come and land on that landing platform, which you see on the right. But this actually failed. Okay, but my thing is this will not go in vain. That's what I believe. Eventually, I think research will triumph, and they will figure out a way to cut the cost by you know properly docking the reusable rocket onto that uh, landing platform in the ocean. Again, it's a it's a frugal concept. This is, uh, you know, you, uh, this professor, you know, Professor Radhika Nagpal at MIT, she has developed these robots which are very cheap. They are like uh, a centimeter, about a centimeter in height, very small robots, and uh, they are spindly legs. They are very cheaply made, okay? And once you look at it, if you're a robotic scientist, you might actually, I don't know, maybe throw up at them or you might not be very happy about them. But what she has managed to do, she can take a swarm of these cheap robots and do some very complicated precision tasks. Okay, there, is also, there are also applications for that. So, you know, like hordes of these very cheap robots can do something very useful. This is something which I like. It's a cheaper particle collider. Okay. Uh, has anybody heard about a particle collider? You have the Large Hadron Collider, right, in Europe, wherein you have these particles which are uh, sent out in very high speeds, right, trying to kind of you know, clash them together, and there are a lot of serious experiments done by particle physicists on them. Uh, in fact, some time back, there was even the fear that these things might create an artificial black hole. You know, thank God, nothing like that happened. Uh, in, 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 in real time, many of these uh, so-called accelerators, right, they have these particles going in rings of like 27 kilometers. In this case, what you see is called SLAC at Stanford University. What you see here, it's a two-kilometer stretch in which these particles are accelerated continuously. And what these scientists are able to do, if you look at the, the, the top one, you know, the top uh, picture that you see there, they have, uh, you know, they have managed to do what you do in two kilometers within 30 centimeters. And by doing so, they have been able to accelerate the particles much faster, 100 times faster than what a conventional accelerator can do. So here you have a frugal technology, which is also very good in what it does, better than the conventional one. Okay. Other than the cost, the functionality is also greatly improved. So plasma afterburner, just 30 centimeters long, accelerates electrons 100 times faster than existing ones. <clears throat> I see people yawning. I promise this will end soon. Uh, there is also this rush to make, uh, you know, cheaper tabletop X-rays. Uh, these are again, you know, dependent on the accelerator technology, where you need like kilometers of a stretch, you know, to keep these, uh, uh, you know, uh, run these particles, accelerate them, and use them for some serious applications, like peering into atoms, like photographing inside an atom. And what peop uh, this particular scientist, I think, again, from Europe, I don't remember her name, I'm sorry about that, she's been able to develop these uh, X-rays, which have very tiny wavelengths, and they pack a lot of energy, and in the process, you need the space just enough to be mounted on a, you know, on a dining table, okay? Again, a very low-cost technology to do some serious particle physics experiments. This is very interesting. So I won't go through the details, okay? Uh, this was done by Professor Graves, University of California at Berkeley, chemistry department. And I have a paper out there wherein I've, I've, I've mentioned this philosophy, how this frugal technology is now coming to the private sector and also to many of these you know, other entities which are seriously involved in uh, you know all kinds of scientific endeavors but to want to cut the cost and surprisingly i think we both kind of think alike my paper was kind of uh, you know referenced by him <clears throat> and lastly this is also great it's called stinky yeah the name is stinky and this was again a, a, a competition between robots and you had to make a robot which will mock uh, like a german u-boat and uh, one of the competitors was MIT from the US. And this group of, you know, the bunch of guys you see there, right? They are not nerds. They are not engineers. They just had the enthusiasm. And when you have a, you know, uh, an institution like MIT, money is not a problem. So these guys invested just $1,000, okay, $1,000, that's it. And they used this PVC pipes, you know, PVC pipes. And everything is like duct taped, you know, made very crudely. And it won the competition, okay, won the competition. The competition was, I forget the name, Falcon something, but it was to mock a German U-boat. It was a robotics competition.
nano teething. This is, I think, uh, the second version. So next generation nanos are ironing out all the issues. Okay, it is get, getting better and better. Okay, I'll be very happy when this thing is finally successful because I think this is one of the flagship, you know, frugal products being put to mass scale use. The need, yeah, the need finally. So those are the you know uh, uses you saw that, or those are the different products that I just covered. Uh, currently, we have a need to maintain the, you know, uh, our environment, and I think this frugal product, this philosophy, uh, has a lot in store for taking sustainability into account. Because you use lesser resources, we are in a way being good to the environment. So frugality rules. I think from here onwards, even for very, you know, uh, serious engineering applications. So what started in the lower income segment is now catching on. Many people don't know about this concept, they are, but they are kind of using it in really serious applications. And the other thing is, you know, the other need is the economy. We have the bottom of the pyramid where this concept got spawned, but I think we should try to use the poor people and the low income segment people to build frugal products and frugal services, you know, at the same time uplifting their, uh, you know, standard of living and also creating, you know, business opportunities. And not to mention, these things can also be sent to, you know, developed markets. There are a lot of users here too for frugal products. And here are some frugal champions. You have Mindre and Lenovo. One thing with uh, frugality is when you become frugal, uh, you tend to use lesser amounts of raw materials. And there is something called a factor of safety in design which takes a beating. So there needs to be more research and more design work going into it to make sure that your innovations are robust. Yeah, they are affordable, they are low cost, but the quality is not sacrificed. So this is what we call factor of safety approach. More research. And I believe that frugal plus science will give us very robust innovations. Again, I think why research? I think uh, the reason I'm showing an airplane here, uh, the aircraft industry also has a very low safety factor, like what I just mentioned. But they use very rigorous design approach, okay? Very rigorous uh, design uh, uh, methodologies. We need to do that for the frugal side too. It is a necessity to make sure that these innovations are good in quality. And lastly, I think uh, if there is uh, uh, some kind of a measure to measure innovation, I kind, kind of propounded this some time back. I wanted to, I was very interested in developing this measure called gross domestic innovation which just measures the innovative output of any given country, okay? And I think I, this measure actually takes frugality into account. It gives a score to every innovation, and if your innovation is sustainable and frugal, it gives you a relatively higher score. Some of my work here. So here are my selected publications. Uh, second, third, and fourth are uh, available on the web. The first one I just uh, presented at IIM Ahmedabad, Indian Institute of Management. They had their grassroots uh, creativity conference. I was called there to give a talk. And the last one, the one in red, right, which says submitted, this is more uh, engineering and you know, uh, engineering design paper, wherein I'm trying to develop a methodology. Uh, if you want to develop a frugal product, you can go systematically by using this approach. Okay? Wherein I'm trying to make sure that enough science and engineering is you know, applied to the product at hand to improve its quality while at the same time maintaining a low cost. And by the way, this is uh, IIT Madras, and I can tell you quite literally it's a jungle out there. Okay, with that, ladies and gentlemen, I'm open to questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for this uh, uh, very colorful and illustrative presentation. Um, are there any questions? I'll start with Peter, and then I'm coming back. Yes. Yeah. Thanks very much. Uh, uh, but, uh, it's an amazing range of examples. Uh, sure. um, and I must admit that I feel more comfortable with, let's say, the first five Agreed. as compared to the last uh, 25. But Agreed. that is maybe my, um, yeah, my hang-up, perhaps. Um, but the question behind that is that if you stretch a concept like frugal or frugal innovation in right. the sense that it encompasses so much, so many quite different things, um, does that not make it more difficult to have, let's say, a, a relatively clear analytical framework on what, where, where, does, where does it stop, in a sense? Uh, okay. 
I, I think what started as a frugal concept, right? And unbeknownst to people who have been calling it frugal, there have been these other companies, right? Private sector and other entities who have also been trying to cut costs, right? And they have been trying to frugalize resources, doing the reverse. Here you have resource-induced innovation, uh, scarcity-induced innovation, and low cost. And these guys are taking low cost and trying to frugalize on the resources. And all these people are doing it at the same time because they want to cut the cost, and this is one of the ways of doing it. So yeah, I've given you many examples here, but the need of the hour is to put more science, engineering, and research into it, exactly. So that, you know, finally, we're able to give products, even in the low-tech or the high-tech sector, products which are good in quality, low in cost, but good in quality, because the human life is at stake, okay? And uh, if you look at sustainable development, if you want to leave a functioning earth to posterity, you need to make sure that you're not going to extract a lot from this planet. So frugality will be very important here. And when you, when you talk about frugality in any engineering or, uh, you know, science application, you have to make sure that your design doesn't take a beating. So yeah, there is a need to systematically, you know, uh, get a methodology for this uh, concept. Maybe I, I may follow up because I, I'm wondering what the word frugality starts to mean. Because there's hacking, there's inventing, there's innovating, and now there's frugalizing. Frugalizing, okay. Yeah, but yeah. So, so where's the limit? So because um, I understood frugality as that it has to have a local impact, for example. It has to be affordable. I mean, there are all these words. So uh, to be smart and hacking a, uh, hacking a telescope or uh, hacking a tractor or inventing a new way to make light with gravity, that is not directly frugal, I thought. So this is my question. OK. See, the, the frugal Sorry? thing. What is? Yeah, but then frugal doesn't add anything to our concept. Yeah. So but I thought frugal actually really means there has to be local meaning and local survival. Agreed. So there are, I would say there are two meanings to it. One is at a local level that you are talking about. These are really, really the grassroots applications. But I'm saying that, you know, it is a little more than that now. Yeah, grassroots, you have things going on. But this concept is also being applied in, you know, in applied in serious products, serious engineering, science, and many of the commercial products you see out there. What's the difference? He can, yeah, he can. But how to make it like, you know, scientifically acceptable? So, frugal is trying to make it acceptable. To make it scientifically acceptable, I'll say. You know, if you come to the engineering community and I say something is frugal, they'll frown upon me. Because something frugal, how can it function? Or, you know, something along those lines. So, the need of the hour is to have more research into this thing, to study this thing and convince others that, yeah, you know, this frugal concept is really serious. Okay, grassroots, I'm sorry to say, many of those things, correct me if I'm wrong, they are makeshift arrangements, right? You're trying to put things together and see if it works. And in the process, you're lowering the cost. But what's the science behind it? Has the science taken a beating? You have to temper your innovations with the knowledge, the detailed knowledge of the product concern. Yeah, I want to rebound on that because it was also triggering to me. I mean, I've learned a lot. Now I'm thinking, what is really frugal? So uh, what I was thinking also is not frugal compared to something. Yeah, uh, it, is, it is relative here. Compared to the incumbent, compared to the competition. The incumbent, yeah, you're right. Like, you know, the telescopes we talked about, like, you know, the, the Doppler radar, there is one that is 10 million, the other is 1 million. It's relative. But the interesting thing is, many of these products, which are developed with cost in mind, are again going to be employed among the low-income society or the poor. The same people are going to use it again. Okay? So it's going to be for their use in the end. So what started as a frugal concept right, by these guys in the low-income segment has now been taken up by other entities who are trying to lower the cost, again trying to deploy the same things in that community where it can be affordable. That's interesting. Many of these things are affordable now, and these people can experience a higher standard of living. That's amazing. That's what science and engineering has done, at least with some of these products we have seen. Thank you. I thought it was very interesting. But one thing I was wondering about, especially in your earlier examples, right. is, um, for example, the bamboo microscope. Right. It might be cheaper, but what about the labor cost that goes into producing it? Because okay. a normal microscope can be kind of mass produced, and especially also the water filtration bicycle. Right. So the bamboo microscope, again, I assure you one thing, it's not made by prison labor. And I think uh, this came in nature, and also know the company, so they, it's kind of fair trade, okay? And uh, uh, that's not a problem there. So labor is taken into account. 
And as far as the water filtration is concerned, we have version 3 out. We still have to work out the cost involved. Okay? So the, the product will be low cost, but I don't know by how much. We need to figure out who's going to make it and all that. So hopefully in a year's time, I can give you more you know, uh, numbers on that. Yeah, I have a comment and a question. The comment yes. is that lots of times you said Africa are doing this, but you didn't say which country. And I think when it comes to frugal Agreed. Agreed. innovation, yeah. Yeah. it's about the context. So, yeah. you know, I, I think we should talk about countries. Agreed, um, okay, uh, definitely. And I think uh, I currently forget the countries, but they're based in Africa. It's definitely not... Uh, uh, some of the popular ones that I know. I'm sorry about that. Okay, okay. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, sure. And my, my question is, um, to what extent do you think that frugal innovation in the developed world is being driven by the financial crisis? And okay. I'm wondering, you know, from your perspective in India, which is obviously a, a country that has benefited a lot from Indians in right. the U.S. and uh -huh. coming back and, you know, the, the circulation of labor between India and the U.S., okay. I'm wondering whether sort of the financial crisis and frugality is sort of changing the, the distribution of expertise when it comes to science. Because a lot of your products are sort of basically, you know, that the people are trying to cut costs in science mm -hmm. in America and <coughs> Europe. Right. So I'm wondering if this is an economic opportunity for India to sort of, you I know, compete. I think it's an economic opportunity for everyone around the world. You look at NSF, NIH in the US, they're all cutting grants. And people are looking, you know, how to do the same thing with lower costs. Okay, it's, it's all coming to what I've just mentioned. So it's not just India, countries around the world are facing this. In fact, currently I think the, the uh, science scene in India, the funding is good, not bad. Okay, and the economy is doing relatively well. The science funding is not bad for us. But yeah, always there is this constraint of budget and everything works around that. But I would say that the same thing now happens in the rest of the world too, especially after this 2008-9 crisis, right? A lot of the things that were done by Unilever found applications in the US. In fact, G, the uh, portable ultrasound and the ECG that they developed has a big market in the US now. Okay, so yeah. Who's? Yeah, the... the, the they are profiting it. Yeah, I mean, it can't do much about that. That's GE. But at least I'm happy that they've taken the concept and they're quite serious about it. There is a frugal healthcare uh, research center in India, in Bangalore. I'm told it's quite good. I haven't visited that yet. Well, I, I, I don't have actually a question, but I, I'm a little bit curious, to, uh, especially to based on uh, remarks made about the definition right. of frugal innovation. And the uh, way Peter said that you have been trying to stretch uh, from one end to the other end. Before coming here, well, last year I have been trying to do some research on <coughs> the definitions of frugal innovations. And I found that uh, there are at least 10 definitions. Mm -hmm. And in my own field of design, that there are more than 600 100, definitions sure. of design. So having said that, uh, I'm, try I'm curious to know First of all, actually asking a question to him. <laughs> why? I'm why, not sure the chair will allow that. Yeah, okay. Tangentially I, to me. I, yeah. I, I, I can ask, ask it through him to you. What is the motivation behind uh, limiting the definition? What is the motivating yeah. factors why you should limit? Uh, are there any reasons to limit? Yeah, I mean, why, uh, that's a very good question, actually. I mean, if this concept is finding wider, you know, ramifications, you know, wider uses, why not? Why not? It's, it's, it's serious, uh, the thing, but regarding the definition, I, I, I like the low-cost part because initially what started with innovating under very scarce conditions and making it affordable has now gone to, maybe some cases, not all, like, you know, you keep the cost low by frugalizing your resource consumption, okay? And again, giving it back to the same community so their standard of living is improved. So but I, I, just like design, just right. like sustainability, just like innovation, right. just like frugal, they are all semantic words, which is free for all. Agreed. Uh, that this is my semantic. Uh, because of that, I think there will be a number of definitions. Agreed. Agreed. And that is the reason why I'm trying to understand why. So this this definition. 
maybe it is a need is needed for research purposes or uh, limiting the research purposes, but generally speaking, there may not be a need at all. So this definition I came across, sorry, you know, if I can take this question. Yeah, go ahead. If you, <laughs> if you see the number of products and services there, I think this one definition kind of encapsulates all of them. You know, low cost, frugalizing resources, again, you know, kind of implementing in the lower income community and maybe also the developed markets. Because you have so many applications now, not just the grassroots. I mean, a lot of these things, telescopes and all, you know, it's a shoestring budget. Yeah, it also kind of follows the... I agree. I agree. And hopefully soon we'll iron these things out and we'll have a much better definition than what I gave you. Am I the last one? Okay. Then um, maybe I'll try and not get into it too deeply because we have a few minutes left and then we have drinks and we had a amazing day, I think. Um, I think your question makes me think about, I mean, why would you limit such a definition? I think this is where we get to um, disciplinary habits and practices. Uh, in social sciences, we tend to have an urge to have concepts that uh, are not stretched out too far, so that we have, that we can develop a relatively common, clear understanding of this is a particular phenomena with these and these sorts of societal impacts, for example, um, so that we can study it in more detail. I, c I can imagine, and I get increasingly the sense that in the disciplines that, that you uh, come from, it works differently. And I think this is uh, an important lesson, in a way, and something that we need to think about more and, and work on. Um, it's not something that I or you can solve now between now and five o'clock. So I, I don't think we, we should even try to do that now. But recognizing that, um, if I'm right, that among the social scientists in the room, there is this urge to indeed narrow down a definition of a concept so that you can actually use it and have it specific indicators that are context specific. While perhaps in engineering, you're trying to be much more universalizing. That might be an issue here. No? OK, well then. I just happened to, I happened to meet you uh, a few months back yeah. in NWO yeah. uh, conference. Yeah. And there also the role of social scientists. I am personally feeling that engineers are, engineers are exact people. Uh, water is water. Water is H2O wherever you go. But because of that, they have been successful in the world. And I have a feeling that social scientists are trying to copy the engineering side, as well as social scientists should not copy. Social scientists should be broad. The world problems are very broad. Okay. So the definition approach of limiting engineering may not be the right approach for social scientists. Right. Good. Okay. <laughs> here, here. Okay. Um, so we're getting into a very fundamental debate now at the very end of, uh, fortunately, uh, this of course is only the a first step in, in this process of trying for this group of people increasingly uh, to move towards a more common understanding of how we deal with these issues. So again, I'm not going to try and summarize. Um, but I'm going to try and say, well, this, uh, for me at least, this was an amazing day uh, in terms of very different, very interesting examples and two also very different uh, broad overviews uh, at the beginning and at the end of our two invited uh, speakers from, uh, from India. Um, I guess without much further ado, uh, I would like to invite you for the drinks which are right above this spot in the building, so on the next floor. Um, thank you very much for being here. I hope you have also enjoyed it and found it as interesting and intriguing and sometimes perhaps difficult to absorb as, as I have, and that it would help us to actually be inspired to work on this 
uh, more in the coming period. And uh, we will be in touch with you, and you can be in touch with us on actually making that happen. So thank you very much for all your contributions. Um, and I hope to see you in a more informal setting in the bar in a few minutes. Thank you. <laughs>